That's what I was just about to say. We are almost ready. We are almost ready. But you do not want to be left out of the giveaway at the end. And you will be left out of that giveaway if you do not complete the survey. So please take these moments to complete the survey and we'll be ready to start momentarily. All right, bring it on in. Well, well, this is it. This is it. This is the moment we have all been waiting for. Why are you not clapping furiously? Right on, right on. This is the moment where the things, the stressful things people do on stage stress all of the rest of you out and amaze you with the ability of the presenters to give a tight five-minute talk with 20 slides, each one advancing automatically every 15 seconds. These are Ignite Talks. And because we are ending with a bang, we have even ordered some lightning and thunder that may show up during this session um, to increase the bang uh, that you feel from this. But really, the substance of that bang is going to come from the great things you hear from our 12 groups of presenters, actually uh, 13 folks here, uh, because one of the Ignites, this is my first time, will have two people presenting at the same time. So that'll be interesting. That's the first group. We also have an interesting situation where one of our groups of Ignite speakers has not yet materialized. So when we get to their slides, we may accept a volunteer from the audience to come on the stage and do their slides. 
Um, so you should be ready for that. Um, before we begin, let me just remind you that there is a survey for you to complete. Please complete it. And there is a phone that has been recovered. If you are missing a phone, please go to uh, the tech desk uh, at some point to find it. Uh, and hopefully the description you give will match the description of the phone they have. Otherwise, they are thieves and have been stealing phones from people. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so I am going to ask you to give uh, a little bit of um, love to the people who are about to come on stage and risk their lives in front of you to ensure them that this is not a circus. It's not a high wire act without a net. You are their net. And I want you to give them the net of your support by thinking of a word or phrase of support and love that you would like them to hear. And when I count to three, I would like you all simultaneously to shout that love to them at one time. It could be, I love you, you're great. It could be, you can do it. It could be your, you know, bank account code. Um, <laughs> Uh, whatever you think will be helpful to them, I'm ready to take notes uh, if that's what you choose to shout out. Uh, but we're going to do that as a um, statement of our love and support. And then at that point, I will get off and let this uh, party start. So are you ready? You have your phrase in mind? Shout it out as loud as you can. Three, two, one. <laughs> I didn't hear any digits there. That's too bad. All right, let's do it. Give it Oof. Let's see how we do this. You got it. Hi, everyone. How's everyone? Hi. So I'll give it up for Mexico. <laughs> Anyone from Mexico? No? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, my name is Pedro Gonzalez. And I'm Camilo Olea. And uh, we're both founders of the project Campbell. Which is actually the Mayan word for to learn. Uh, Campbell, it's actually an innovation lab for digital preserve the Mayan culture of our region. And we are based in Cancun. Who's, who has been to Cancun here? <laughs> Woo! Who has a free trip? No. So but, okay, Cancun is cool and all, but there are many indigenous communities, Mayan communities, seriously lacking infrastructure, such as internet access and phone access. Uh, a lot of inequalities that lead, leads us to uh, meet each other. Yeah, in an event such as like this one, and after a few drinks and feeling like we can do anything, uh, we decided to tackle this problem because, you know, our ancestral built our city in a lake, so whatever. <laughs> yeah, because Mexico, right? Yeah, Mexico. Um, in that moment, I was actually studying mechatronics engineering, and I was experimenting with some hardware um, such as Arduino Raspberry Pi. As you may already know, uh, know uh, Raspberry Pi has too many uh, uses, and one of these is to uh, make it function as a web server and as a local as a local web server and as a Wi-Fi hotspot itself. So any device with Wi-Fi can connect to it. And uh, we can uh, upload with internet content without actually internet access, such as the whole Wikipedia, PDFs, and several videos. Uh, we have the opportunity to present this project to the representatives of several rural communities. This was actually the first uh, community that we approached, and this is a picture of the first day we approached it. So uh, we basically explained them how this will benefit their students and their teachers. Uh, until that moment, after some research and some uh, questions and answers, presentations, and too many stuff that we did, uh, we have the enable of the first Mayan uh, rural high school with 120 students. It was just only one of the classrooms. Um, and yeah, basically, we did that. So uh, not, sure, not long after, we got uh, accepted at Tecnia, which is a large uh, technological park of the, one of the biggest colleges in Mexico, and we got incubated there. So we actually won. That's, that's us winning the prize for the best pitch of the generation. So give it up. Woo! <laughs> And uh, so uh, um, that allowed us to have more exposure, which in turn uh, came, uh, put us in contact with uh, a lot of um, sponsors. We have self-funded this so far, along with uh, many sponsors. These are different uh, enterprises. And we have a presence in more than five uh, um, different rural communities in, in the Quintana Roo area. Each one of them is different, and we first approach them and know what they need before bringing them anything. We, so ability, this we enable this in rural high schools, community centers, and uh, the municipal uh, places. 
Uh, at the moment, we, don't, we, we were not only allowing to enable the internet content without internet access, we also were experimenting by teaching them uh, content in 360 videos, VR games, and other kind of learning experience. That's, uh, we, what, that's why we are actually um, why here today. Um, uh, also, to train the teachers how the technology will uh, uh, benefit them. Because at the very first moment, they didn't allow the students to enter with the, with the phones because they think they were only playing. But nowadays, they're uh, actually studying. So then we got uh, Ms. Kathy Brown, which at the time was the president and CEO of Internet Society, which is, as you know, the largest organization in the world uh, bringing the internet to the people. And uh, we got her to Aguasul, which is the first place where we uh, installed Campbell. So then we secured a grant of $3,000 that allowed us to bring now the internet to these people. This is deep in the Mayan jungle. And as you can see, there's an antenna uh, with a receiver. So what we found out, uh, as you say here, you know, give the people the tools and let them use it, right? Because then uh, the fathers of the, of the children that went, that went to the school started using these to sell their products. These are artisan products made from uh, these bees uh, that only exist in Yucatan, and they uh, increase their sales by 60%. So these persons are really, really uh, using the internet for, for um, you know, their own good. good. Uh, again, uh, we got more exposure in turn by these are some of the top media in Mexico. And uh, this has been very helpful because uh, everybody here knows what, what a, a Raspberry Pi is, right? But uh, you know, not everybody knows that back in Mexico. So these uh, articles have allowed us to explain more. And uh, I just want to know who in here has not given a TED talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I knew. Yeah, that's what I talked. So that's me back in the you know the, the tall guy brown. So uh, yeah, we <laughs> <The tall guy laughs> I presented brown, yeah. also the, the the platform there, and we got more um, associates. Uh, this year, actually, we were selected to feature during the Social Enterprise Conference. As you may know, it's actually uh, hosted by the Harvard Business School. So yeah, this is my second time in Boston. Woo! Woo! <laughs> and yeah, so we uh, arrived this project based in Cancun until uh, to the one of the most uh, privileged schools in the in the whole world, such as Harvard, and also was selected by a UN headquarters at New York to presenting during the Science, Technology, and Innovation Forum this year, actually just a month ago. So basically, that's all, friends. Uh, muchas gracias. Um, and let's hope that you like the project. And now you have another reason to come to Cancun. See you in Cancun, guys. Yeah, you have <laughs> another reason to visit Cancun. Uh, can we make a brief story? Shout out to Cancun. Woo! <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. I'll give up some of my time to two Latin guys from the jungle. Hi. <laughs> I need a sound of awesomeness for my talk. That's okay. Well, who the heck am I? Well, I am Danielle. I am a maker educator. I come from the informal world, and I'm thinking about going into the formal world. It's interesting. So I said, how do I want to use the time on stage with you today is tell you how I landed and where I'm at and where I'm going with this. So I'm thinking, how might I straddle both informal, and that means like after school, boys and girls club, computer clubhouse, and formal, and then I mean K through 12, and sometimes K through 16, 18, right? How did I get there? Well, it takes 21 days to form a habit. It takes 52 weeks in a year, that's way too big. But 31 days in a month, that's kind of short. So I'm like, hmm, how many of something do I want to think about? Well, there's 31 flavors at Baskin Robbins, and I'm kind of sweet. I like ice cream. So I'm like, 31 flavors. And then I'm, ooh, I'm from the early 90s. And so when I think about flavors, I think about Ani DeFranco. And she was 32 flavors and then some. And I'm like, hey, wait, I'm turning 42 this year. So maybe I should be 42 flavors and then some, right? Because 42 is the answer to the question of the ant. Okay, now I know who's in the crowd. Okay, so there's 42. But then when I did a little research on it, I read the book, and then actually 42 is a completely arbitrary joke number, which I was like, is perfect for this talk. So, right? So I have 42 flavors and then some, and I'm bridging both makers who are the geekiest people in the world that want to do a awesome a lot of stuff, but sometimes can't explain it to anybody, with educators who want to do a lot of awesome stuff, but always want it to be aligned to standards and put on assessments and like kill my buzz every time I'm trying to do maker education. So why I'm here is I'm not going to straddle it, I'm going to bridge it, right? And I stand in a certain stance because I read Shauna Rhimes' autobiography, and basically she says if you stand in a power stance every day, you will feel powerful, but also you will bridge, you'll have a more open mind, and you will have life-wide learning, right? I come from lifelong learning, well, I'm wide. 
right? So informally, these guys basically, they've really thought about how to be more creative and how to replicate things that are in the past and in the future and make it awesome and make it fun. I want to bring that to formal places, right? The formal guys have really figured out, though, like, what are the skills-based things I need to do? What do I really want to know? What do the kids have to do? What do they have to be, right, to be out there and do this kind of stuff? So I want to bring those two things together by standing there and being wide and thinking about it. So I think it's like yin and yang. We actually, in our makerspace at Foothill College, where I work, have a wall of awesomeness and failure that's yin and yang, right? And there's a tidal wave that both, if we get in our little bubble and be equal and roll along with it, that maybe it'll all kind of fit together. So I'm 42 flavors and then some. I'm going to be like Cold Stone, and I'm going to fold this all together. I'm going to give you a couple scoops. So I made this. New Year's resolution to do 42 blog posts. I've done one, <laughs> right? But here's the first six. So number one is find something that you don't know and get super geeky about it till it's completely ridiculous and then do it with kids. So I got really geeky about um, this big meme that got started out of the tinkering studio around making automata and that got went. So number two is not done, right? Basically informal educators, if I can get them over their in like comfortableness, uncomfortableness of things never being done, we could get a lot more done, right? Number three, just show up. This sounds so obvious, but I know somebody that wrote a PhD thesis that, that this was the core of it, right? Just showing up with the right people in the right room and then talking to each other, some awesome stuff can kind of happen together. Number four, exchange shoes. They can be 3D printed shoes, right? But this was one of the best experiences in the last six months is I put a guy who's like a really great woodworker and I said, write, you know, do a workshop and then write me an evaluation for it and it was beautiful, right? I just put the right person in the right shoes. And then the last thing is take a really cool project that got a lot of people excited and turn it into a lesson plan. It won't kill it. It'll be okay. You could put some standards on it. It actually did align and it was pretty amazing. And I tried it out with some middle schoolers and they said, all oh, that's really complicated, but I like this one part, Danielle, keep rolling with it. And I said, yes. And the last one, number six, scoop number six, is basically take a concept and go across things with it, right? I did Scrabble name tags across every tool in our makerspace. I thought about how I can make a uh, portrait and do that. So my last thing for you guys is I have 36 more scoops. Follow me and make me stick to it. Thank you very much. Um, 42 is really the answer um, to everything. <laughs> My name is Alex. I'm head of the Center for Applied Game Studies at Donau Universität Krems in Austria. And I'm also the blockchain consultant to the government of Malta. Malta is a beautiful island in the Mediterranean Sea and definitely worth a visit. In Austria, we somehow love to show our academic titles and credentials. <laughs> However, it's quite easy to just make them up or put them on a slide. And in daily life, there are no background checks if you're really a doctor. <laughs> in fact, credentials are extremely difficult to validate. As education is nowadays globalized and therefore 100% international, there is still no cross-border standards in place, neither offline or online. So what happened is that, and this is not meant negative at all, is that we created a community of trust. So we simply trust each other, but sometimes we need to show our learning credentials if we apply for a job. So how does this happen? Um, we basically scan our diplomas, we convert them into a PDF file, we send them via email, and sometimes when we maybe get the job, we have to come with our original documents. But what does an original document mean? One of my masters, uh, I finished it at the Alaska Pacific University, and it's only original when it is printed on blue paper. How should a clerk in Austria know that this is actually the original certificate from uh, that university? We could use digital uh, signatures provided, for example, by the Austrian government or other governments, but still uh, there is no uh, verification and uh, no, accept no cross-border acceptance. So blockchain could save us all. It's a big hype at the moment. But basically there are a lot of things um, to, uh, to consider. 
So yes, using blockchain can create a secure system that verifies both the educational entity and the learner. And no, blockchain in general is still at its infancy stage and there is one important field of error involved and those are humans. Humans, besides greed and fraud on purpose, the red tape and paperwork from the exam to the entry of the grades of the diploma involves many steps where mistakes can but should not happen. Humans make mistakes and also humans interacting with computer systems make mistakes. At our university, for just some moments, the algorithm to, to give the grades were messed up. So it's not only the humans, it's also the, the interaction with it. And another big issue is basically that more and more systems show up and compete with each other to be the one blockchain for education. So MIT has the block cert system. And then many universities and schools will use in future different uh, blockchain grading systems. And I have the feeling that instead of solving and saving the world, uh, we will end up in a total mess. And there are, of course, the corporate system, which are basically a private uh, uh, permission blockchain system. So the ownership of the data is not with the learner or with the alumni. The ownership of the data stays uh, with companies that just use the word blockchain as a marketing gag. So at the end of the day, there is an intermediate system needed that gives uh, the ownership uh, back, uh, back to the learners and to the universities. And that should be uh, a combination of electronic ID wallets and um, a main chain system verifying and a child chain system basically uh, tokenizing um, the, the, the learning credentials and giving ownership ship back to the people. But we still have the issue with uh, the humans, as said before. They're always the problem, so we have to bring assessment and the grading closer to each other. The grading shall take place the moment the assessments are conducted and furthermore oral exams should be confirmed and digitally signed from both sides directly after they are done. One step further is the direct assessment through theory as games as assessment tools, directly transforming game goals set as learning goals into credible events. And of course, some subjects would work better with that and others not. I will kickstart digital game-based learning assessment uh, next week at te Texas A&M. I would love to stay in touch with you. I'm at Alex Pfeiffer on Twitter. Auf Wiedersehen, Baba. While, while I'm waiting for that, who in here has ever run a role-playing game? Okay, who in here is a teacher? Okay, great. This is the right crowd. I'm in the right room. So I'm Scott Price. I'm director of product at BrainPop, but today I'm going to be talking about two of my other lives, the ones I just mentioned. I've been in games for about a decade, and I've been in the field of education twice that long, and an ardent game player for just over three times as long. A few years ago, I was preparing the climax of a Dungeons & Dragons game that I'd been running for four years. I was quite anxious, as this game had gone very well, and I really wanted to end it on a high note. My players had invested themselves in their characters and in the figuratively literal manner of a tabletop role-playing game. I'd watch them explore, literally, grow, literally, and fight, mostly figuratively. I wanted to prepare an adventure that would really tie together all of the themes that they'd raised with their characters, and it would be a novel challenge, hard but fair, and a just test of their, both their stats and their creativity. But I couldn't just write it. If I wrote everything out in exactly the order it should happen, it would be, we, we call that railroading in, uh, in, in game design. And it wouldn't be interactive. Uh, when a GM is the only one to make the decisions, it's just boring. Games are about meaningful choices. And at the same time, I couldn't just plan everything and lay it out ahead of time and hope that they stayed on track, that I had prepared the right things, and that a passing butterfly didn't just lead them off uh, and derail everything. This was, uh, I'd felt this anxiety before as I was preparing during my student teaching, working with 30 plus really different people who all needed individual experiences that nevertheless got them exactly where I needed them to go. And it mattered to them, just like it mattered to my players. So at that point I realized that good GMs uh, could prepare like teachers do. And good teachers might run games well. 
that is to say in language more appropriate for uh, CLS, that uh, role pl good role-playing game experiences are player-driven, individualized, adaptive, meaningful, contextualized, project-based, interactive experiences. And this actually gave me some confidence. Um, I had been a good teacher and I could handle those th the, the 30 students, I could probably handle this group of four, although I'd have to prepare a bit differently. Understanding that has changed how I teach when I do and also changed how I design games, and I think that these two worlds have a lot to say to each other. So game designers. Recent narrative-focused RPGs have taken Chekhov's gun to a new level. If a player mentions something at the beginning of the game, it's a theme. Get it in the game. Make your game recognize and respond to it. Uh, in uh, the game GameStar mechanic that I made, we saw four roles in the community and we gave XP for those actions to recognize how those work together. Teachers already know this, but the backstory is everything the students are bringing to the class. Uh, in one of the English classes that I taught, we listened to what the students had been reading, and those worked into the curriculum a year or so later if they were a good game for it. Designers, your players are also bringing different priorities to your game, and this means that what you give them and what they play is filtered and made by them. Design adventures for their learning styles, priorities, and community. And teachers, your side of this is that the game that, that you put in front of them and that they're playing is only half of the real game. In this collectible card game that I've got up here, uh, there, there are way more than two players that are an integral part of this game. Uh, also to teachers, here's a challenge. Character sheets are how RPGs concisely store and communicate the data that's important to the rules of the game and modeling a character and character progression. What's your character sheet? How can you communicate it? Designers, Backward Planning from the book Understanding by Design is one of the greatest game design books I've ever read, even though it's for teachers. Uh, it's a great process for making quests. Start with a project or task that would show proficiency, step back to the skills required to do it, and then make your encounters around building those skills or practicing them. Uh, my games now start with what I want the players to do, learn, or experience, and an authentic task that tests that skill. There's my boss batter, battle or my climactic encounter, and we just lead up to that. Foreshadowing looks a lot like good curriculum design. I've also thrown out uh, branching narratives. The players uh, will find another path no matter what I've planned. So my adventures are now a network or even a grab bag of encounters with prerequisites and notes about what the outcomes of those encounters might do to the world. Teachers use, uh, do that same thing with uh, moments for clear formative assessment. Those are chances to see what the students understand, check where they still need to go, and update the lesson plan. That leads to player or student engagement and individualized instruction or character plots. Also, does a challenge for both sides. Make scenarios for players to solve, not riddles or puzzles where they have to do just what the game wants. This is hard but profound. Design the challenge and provide the tools. Don't come up with a single answer and walk it back because that's about you, not them. Finally, the best teachers that I've seen jump into the unknown with their students. This has been a big theme today. Uh, they, they think through the game and actively let the, let the students lead. Designers, design your games for this by supporting the teacher with what they need to know that lets them know and how to make it safe to let the students run crazy. If you make games for learning, understand that your game is an adventure module that you're going to put in front of a, of a teacher. The teacher will play it with their party for the highest of stakes. Let's swap guidebooks and learn from each other. And let's design like great teachers so we can teach like great teachers. Uh, if you could just pause the slides for a second, I've got um, some good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is that for you grotesque weirdos who were waiting to see some random person talk through slides they didn't make, I'm sorry we can't let that happen. The good news is that we found Justin Reich. Yeah, that's it. Is this working? Can you hear me? That, that was a huge bummer and I apologize. Um, <laughs> There's, there's incredible work um, that's happening in this community that's exploring large-scale learning, um, places uh, with many, many learners and few experts to guide them. And a lot of the research that's been done in this field has been in little monographs and articles and things like that. Um, and me and Nicole Pinkard and uh, Susan Buckley at the MIT Press um, have been thinking it would be a great time to get some longer form writing about these things. And so we've started a book series, which all of you can uh, submit proposals to, um, called the Learning in Large-Scale Environment Series from the MIT Press. And what I want to do with these few minutes um, is to tell you a little bit about how we're starting to think about uh, learning in large-scale environments and what we might think be some interesting questions within that, and then tell you a little bit about submitting a book um, and empower you to be able to go forward with that. Um, so uh, this is one sort of core definition that we have running. What are all the different kinds of places where there are many, many learners and few experts to guide them? Um, even if you might be in a classroom with 20 students, but if you're sending your students out to write fan fiction where there are 2 million people writing 
writing together who might be editing and sharing with one another. Um, one useful way to divide up uh, large-scale learning environments is to think about the kind of people who are sort of controlling the learner's action or guiding the learner's action. So here are sort of three categories of them. Um, some uh, large-scale learning environments are guided by teachers, like MOOCs, where there's someone who sets up a series of, exper of experiences in an order. Some are like intelligent tutors, where the decisions or the uh, responses that an individual makes um, leads to some kind of adaptive algorithm that leads to some kind of different learning experience. Um, and then some are peer-driven learning environments, like Scratch or Fan Fiction, where really your interactions with other people um, determine what the learners do next. Um, these kinds of learning environments tend to take their inspiration from different kinds of educational thinkers. Um, some of them are more along the lines of how can we refine learning experiences into a kind of science that can be improved like Edward Thorndike might have wanted us to do? Um, or how do we think about learning experiences as apprenticeships um, that prepare us for the rigors of life in the way that John Dewey imagined? Um, we think one potential problem is that these different kinds of environments actually get typically examined by different kinds of researchers. So there are folks who might go to learning at scale or learning analytics and knowledge that are learning really cool stuff about MOOCs, and there are people who go to artificial intelligence um, in education or educational data mining that are learning really cool stuff about intelligent tutors, and there are people who might be coming to here or coming to CHI who are learning really cool things about these peer-driven learning environments. But the insights from these different communities actually might have really neat ways of informing one another, um, that even though these different environments sort of have different structures and they have different ideas behind them, they actually share some common features and challenges. Um, one of the linking features across them uh, is just the structure of data. Um, the, the, to the extent that these are online environments, each of these online environments depend upon databases that are actually quite similar to one another across uh, different structures. There are some common problems across them, too. Um, one might be, I think the first one to come up, is the paradox of free, um, which is that we often imagine that taking these things and putting them online for free will disproportionately benefit the learners who are furthest from opportunity. And we often find that actually the reverse happens, that they disproportionately benefit the students who have the most financial, social, and technical capital to take advantage of new innovations. Um, the curse of familiar is that it's really difficult to get people to adopt learning environments that are different from what they're used to in traditional schools. Um, but we won't get much substantially better learning environments if we just give people sort of online versions of things that they've experienced for a long time. The paradox of routine is that assessment drives a lot of these different kinds of a learning environments. Um, and computers are actually really good at assessing the kinds of things that we don't need human beings to do anymore. Um, so we might be able to explore, those are ex three examples of themes that you might be able to explore across these different learning environments. Some of these large scale learning environments operate at truly global scales where there are millions or hundreds of millions of learners all spread out throughout the world. It's not the only possible definition of scale. You know, one of the things that inspires me most about Nicole Pinkard's work is how Chicago is the place that she thinks of as scale. Um, there may be other kinds of definitions of scale too, so we don't want people to get stuck with any one particular vision, um, but to imagine Imagine if there are lots and lots of learners, if there are more learners that can fit in a classroom um, or in a space with one person who's an expert, then you're probably investigating something that might fit into what we're doing. So you're thinking to yourself, man, I've got some great ideas of what would be a great book for this. How do I go about submitting a book proposal? And the main thing is like, go to that website and do it. But you'll, you'll have sort of three parts to that. The first part's going to be a prospectus. And the prospectus is going to explain to the MIT press crowd, um, how is this book different from other books that are out there? Um, how will it would compete in that marketplace? And who are people or categories of people that are likely to buy this book? The second thing that you'll give us is kind of a detailed table of contents, which sort of explains for us how the argument will be laid out. It's like an annotated table of contents. These are the parts of my ideas and how they might uh, flow together. And then finally, um, you can actually submit with those two things, but I think really compelling um, book, uh, book submissions have a couple of sample chapters so that we see how you're, you're planning on um, uh, bringing all these things together. So if you have a book idea, we're super excited to hear from you. Susan, can you sort of wave and say hi? Susan's the acquisition editor at uh, MIT Press who's guiding this. A bunch of you know who Nicole Pinkard are, and now you know what I look like because I'm standing up here. Um, and we love to hear more about your ideas um, and be able to think about whether or not they might fit into this new book series. So uh, thanks for listening. Howdy, folks. I'm Maggie Ricky, and I'm going to get our running start on this. So I'm here to ask the musical question, where's the after-school club for teachers? So the literature is full of all these studies of after-school clubs for the kids, right? And you got your great goals, and you got your, your just enough structure, and your mentors and everything. And 
And, um, you know, we'd use the phrases like, oh, these people are building new identities as programmers, as designers, as makers, as mentors. And, you know, in the best examples, these, these programs have fabulous, you know, outcomes for the kids. And I, I actually got to see some of that firsthand last night. I went over to Boston University for the uh, Teen Summit of the Clubhouse Network, which was very eye-opening, a lot of energy over there. Um, <laughs> so... Um, I just thought that I've completely lost my place, but it will all come back to me. So when I decided I was going to contribute to this conference in some way, I went back to an idea that I had um, many years ago when I actually took a couple of learning sciences courses, and I was really struck by the computer clubhouse, by the philosophy and, and the success of it. Um, and so when I revisited this idea several months ago to actually submit the proposal. I swear I completely forgot the computer pl clubhouse started here, so this is not pandering, at least not intentional. Um, so, so back to these life-changing experiences for the teachers, right? So, you know, there's professional development ooh, for the teachers who want to learn about digital literacy and stuff, but really my question is, how come the kids have all the fun? They're out there making, you know, oh, I've got my new identity as a pro programmer or designer, but the teachers are still just teachers, and they need professional development. So I wanted to think about a space, both mental and physical, where, you know, the teachers get to do this kind of stuff, right? They get to go try something new. They get to learn something just for the sake of learning it. They get to say, oh, I could even fail. Um, and they could learn things even if it's not strictly applicable to what I have to teach in the classroom. Because somewhere I heard that autonomy, competence, and connectedness were important for learning. So, now what happens next? Oh yeah, so if I thought I was going to stand in front of this, of this room full of people and talk about this thing that I'm sure you all know way more about than I do. I thought I should take a look at what's been done since I had that idea like seven or eight years ago. But I found it very frustrating to search for what you could do with teachers in an after-school program because all you come up with is teachers doing stuff for kids in after-school programs. But I did found this, find this one article that talked about teachers after being surveyed about how they want to do their professional development saying, oh, we actually want to work in design teams with other teachers on design projects. Aha! Hmm, autonomy, competence, and connectedness. So there's this idea that, oh, maybe training and this, this you know, sort of standard professional development are not the only ways to go about this. And why is that? Well, training rarely, you know, gets you to this place of learning and mastery that are deeply, even biologically pleasurable, um, which is one of my favorite quotes from James Paul G. So, if we were going to create a space like this, I thought, well, what, what's a good model for that? Oh, these guys have been doing this for a long time, so there's a, there's a great model out there, and um, they were make, doing maker spaces like before they were a thing, right? So if you were going to design something, oh, I think we've been hearing about this for the last three days, right? What would it look like to make something for teachers to actually have this kind of experience? We've got the models. We just kind of have to... Let the teachers be the inmates instead of the guards. So what would be the goal for something like this? What would be the goal for this kind of thing? Well, I think the first would be to get teachers back to the point of remembering that learning is biologically even, is biologically pleasurable, right? And, and then the second goal would really be for me to steal the clubhouse learning model straight off their website, learning by design, <laughs> following your interests, um, building a community, fostering respect and trust. Because you know why I would start here and why I copied this completely like this? Because it's working. And so, you know, I would certainly start there. So, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, um, you know, is it professional development? Well, you know, maybe in a model like this, teachers would actually professionally develop things like new ways of thinking about learning. Um, just the ability to, to just sort of go beyond that, you know, rote stuff. And so, yeah, it's probably professional development, but please don't call it that. Maybe they'll actually come.
I'm slowing this down. <laughs> Hi, I'm Doris. I make games about the human experience, including mental health issues. And I'm a little upset by this idea that games are there to change people. I want to challenge that. I want to challenge that they can be therapy. I got into all of this thing years ago when I was a postdoc at MIT, and more or less by accident, ended up making a game about substance abuse called Acrasia. And right at that time when we made this game, uh, Ben Sawyer, who's the founder of the G Games for Health movement, reached out to us and said, do you have anybody who could present at the Games for Health conference? And people pointed and said, she's doing an addiction game. <laughs> So yeah, that's where it all started. And I got kind of sucked into this Games for Change space and I was really happy there for a decade making games about anxiety and depression and all of that good stuff. And people kept asking, so can you prove these games work? And I thought, well, probably could, but it would probably be bullshit. <laughs> but I still wanted to know more about that. And so I enrolled in, um, a grad degree for clinical and mental health counseling. And there are some things that I learned doing that. First of all, patients enter therapy when they're ready for change and they consent to this thing. Like we don't consent really. When you play a game, the game doesn't ask you, do you want to be changed? Like, no. Also, there are about 400 different counseling theories out there and all of them have relationship as the cornerstone of personal transformation. When you play a game, the designer is long gone. And that's a good thing, because a game designer is the last person you want by your side when you're having a breakdown, because <laughs> we enter this field, so we are far away from human emotion. <laughs> Games for change are chock full of helpful messages and strategies we sneak into our rules, Therapists know it's silly to teach a drowning man how to swim if he doesn't really want to swim. So how do you do that? Um, games are really good at teaching you through your actions and the consequences to your actions. Well, that works fine for math because math is somewhat objective and we can craft these rules. But what about learning about yourself? In a game, you do not explore your inner landscape. Games are puzzles to be solved, and the designer holds the answering key. So, <laughs> how do you learn about yourself? In therapy, there is somebody to guide you on your journey. It's your inner landscape that you're exploring, right? And they point towards the places where you should go. But the only person who is actually empowered to solve the patient's puzzle is the patient. Now imagine you go to a therapist for the first time and the person says, Psh, don't say a word, I know exactly how to fix you. You think negatively, no problem. Just focus on these yellow balloons over there with the positive words and ignore all the black ones with the nasty words. That's the kind of mental health learning that works really well in games, cognitive behavioral stuff, because we can craft rules from that. But get this, so Stanford Brainstorm Innovation Lab director, Dr. Nina Vazan said, I'd rather people see a doctor. But short of that, I'd rather have them play video games than self-medicate. So, hey, we are a step up from heroin. <laughs> now, so what can we do? <laughs> the mind is mostly unconscious. If we really want to change people, no, we don't want to change people at all. But if you want to evoke change, we should go below the surface. And we might want to draw on myth, because myth does that. It gets us in contact with our deeper selves. But it doesn't do that by preaching at us. It does that by holding up a mirror. And whether you look into it or not is really up to you. Yeah, it's up to you to say this resonates emotionally. And this emotional resonance creates a longing, a desire for change that is intrinsically motivated. And I find that very, very interesting. However, here's the scary part. If you want to make mythical games, you've got to put something of yourself into this. You've got to grow some ovaries, yes? You've got to look at your shit. 
And you make games about that. And that is really scary. So here are some books for you to get started on that. But that's, I tell you, I think it's the only way to really build a relationship with the player. And stop trying to change them. Like, leave it up to them and change the way you dare to make games. <laughs> Hi everyone, is this working? All right, uh, my name is Leah Shell, and I'm going to tell a story about how one class ignited my curiosity and changed the way I saw the world. Um, I was working my way through my first year of my undergrad and I stepped into the right place at the right time. Before that, each professor seemed more bored than the next and perhaps because the lectures were hundreds of people and we were supposed to be weeded out by all of our classes and I wasn't sure to where. Um, and then I just assembled into a class that changed everything. Introduction to entomology. I felt like I'd walked into a room where everyone wanted to be. I'd been searching for that place where you're continuously curious and can't run out of things to be curious about. A tub of lubber grasshoppers was put into my hands almost as soon as I walked into the door. <laughs> That's what they look like. Um, I'd never seen anything so amazing, and I'd never thought to look at something like that up close. They were beautiful. Um, the mere thought of my whole life up until that point, I had just bent down and looked a little bit closer. Um, I would have notice this universe under my feet. Insects churn our soil, pollinate our flowers, decompose, well, they're everywhere, um, that's the point. So bugs, people were supposed to be afraid of these things, and for the life of me, I could not figure out why. I kept trying to come up with more and more reasons to be around them. I took more classes, I begged for jobs in entomology labs, I stopped, couldn't stop obsessing over their names. Um, this is a cuckoo wasp in the family, Chrysididae. I quickly learned that any insect with a name that starts with the word chryso, meaning gold, was just really, really, really beautiful. Um, and then again, some caterpillars look like bird poop. Uh, this, these are the eggs of lacewings. They look like pearls on silk. Um, and insects and plants go through this coevolution. That's, that's why they continue to have this arms race and why they look as beautiful and interesting as they do. So every conversation I had led me to learning more about bugs and trying to teach someone about bugs. And suddenly these animals that everyone seemed to fear were the source of a great inspiration to me. I was a person infested with an idea. And my idea was that if I could share the way I see the world with others, maybe others would too come to realize that their impact was bigger than they knew. And every footprint was above a universe of ants making their homes, tending their young, and farming their food. Not only was there more outside, there was more inside. I began working in the Rob Dunn lab at NC State studying insects that live inside of our homes. Thousands of species, thousands of animals living in our homes and representing the biodiversity of our daily lives. My passion is helping um, excuse me, <laughs> helping others to see what scientists do. I went beyond my lab walls and became a teacher. I went beyond my school and developed curriculum for more teachers to teach kids about how cool bugs were. And I worked with artists like Daniel Carrico highlighting insects and their unique beauty. I use citizen science to help contribute to this body of knowledge while helping others do the same. If you don't know what that insect is, you can now take a picture and use iNaturalist and AI along with the hive mind of entomologist, and they'll tell you. Uh, citizen science is the public involvement in authentic scientific research. If we can empower more students to participate in real research earlier in their lives and empower scientists to trust the public as collaborators, imagine the investment we could all collectively have in preserving our planet's biodiversity. You can use the same technology to tell Dr. Lori Shapiro at Harvard where you see cucumber beetles on pumpkins. Nobody knows who's eating or pollinating our pumpkins or jack-o'-lanterns. Um, there's power in your data about insects, too. By telling scientists how many ants are attracted to different baits in the Project Ant Picnic, we can learn more about what foods are available to them in nature. If we can learn about their behavior, we can learn about them. For the past five years, I've been the curator of digital media to help educators bring citizen science into their classroom, and scientists to bring their citizen science to the people who need it, bored middle school students. <laughs> My latest adventure is with SciStarter. Our goal is to connect scientists to educators through a robust database and data entry platform supporting thousands of citizen science projects. 
We are also de developing LMS compatible software to be used in school districts so that teachers can track their students' participation in projects. We help take science out of the lab and ignite the potential of citizen scientists working together to contribute to science. Through citizen science, you can put into practice ways to combat fear with curiosity by connecting educators, scientists, and the public. Insects continue to inspire my curiosity, and I hope that the way you see the world has changed just a little bit, and that you'll also share it with others. Thank you, and now go look at some bugs. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kristana Texter. I am a PhD student at um, the University of Rochester, um, and I am at the Warner School of Education. Um, I study video games and learning, um, and I am an expert uh, on neither wrestling nor manga. So I don't know much about these at all, but the students that I worked with for this research project are, and I am going to share some of their insights with you today. So this story starts at a summer camp where we started working with um, groups of 12 to 14 year olds organized by our PI, Lynn Gatto, who's phenomenal. Um, and we, uh, they were all self-identified gamers. We had eight boys and one girl. Um, we can talk about gender later if anybody wants to talk about balancing gender in uh, game clubs. Um, but this is our team. So we followed them for six months and uh, we gave them iPads to take home with them to play that were um, embedded with a suite of software and video games that were intended to enhance literacy. Um, the kids were very active participants in this research. We had cameras in their hands. We taught them how to use them. Um, we generated over 15 hours of research that Lynn and I then uh, coded. And um, the research that we were, uh, what we were doing was investigating their relationships to reading, okay? So we used a bunch of different games for this. The games were um, talking points that were a uh, jumping off point to discuss um, their habits with reading. We weren't measuring uh, the effectiveness of the games. We weren't measuring how people learned anything. But oftentimes when we talk about reading, um, people interpret that, can interpret that as uh, literature and, and then often think about the classics. And I'll tell you something, these kids were not reading Jane Eyre on their spare time, okay? Um, instead, the conversations that we had uh, with the kids, what came up for them that was so exciting was manga and professional wrestling. This is all we wanted to talk about when we talked about reading, okay? So you think, what in the world do manga and wrestling have to do with the classics? Well, there's a deep, deep narrative involved in all those forms of media, right? So they all have story, um, they all have conflict, they've got backstory, they've got relationships. It's, there's a lot to chew on for them. So we would have our sessions at the public library and we'd talk about, um, talk about what they're reading and they would race to the shelves and grab their favorite manga and say, you know you read it backwards, right? You know that, right? And they got so excited. They were just absolute love for manga was through the roof. Wrestling came up quite a bit as well. And I know that this is not exactly reading and writing. There's not a lot of um, text or words that happen in wrestling. But I present it as a multimodal form of storytelling to you now. So the games that we used and we played, uh, we did use a little bit of Street Fighter V, just to let you know, all had a fighting mechanic, okay? And that fighting mechanic allowed us to have conversations about conflict, but on, the sta on, on a stage, right? Like in a staged area. Um, since we were playing fighting games, we absolutely had to have a tournament, so we did. And one of the activities that we did for this tournament was um, to co-construct rules together, right, for our tournament rules. Now that led us into some really interesting conversation about rule breaking, about cheating, about alignment of characters, and who's a cheater. And this is where things kind of took an interesting turn, especially in their um, knowledge of the wrestling world. So they were quick to tell me that you know wrestling's fake, right? And I said, oh, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> this is <laughs> it's good information. But I said, well, so if wrestling's fake, then how, how does anybody cheat if it's all staged? And they said, oh, well, people cheat all the time. You might use a chair or a weapon or sneak up on someone. Cheating happens backstage, you know, and whatever happens backstage, that's real. Okay. <laughs> They were adamant about this fact, and their number one argument about knowing that this was real was, 
There are cameras, there are cameras. We see what happens on camera. We know that it's real because we see it on camera. And I thought, this is a really interesting time to think about media literacy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, these kids know cameras. They were operating cameras for our research project, and they're, they're consuming and interacting with media all the time. But it just felt like there was maybe a bit of a missing link here between reality. Um, and I think that it's an especially important thing to uh, address today when we don't know what's real, and we need kids to be critical thinkers about the things that they're consuming. So as we're redefining literacy from a text base, um, from texts into multimodal media, what I wonder is, how can we empower kids to have more access to media literacy? And I think back to our time in the library. The kids knew exactly where all the manga was. They had relationships with every single librarian in that library, and they spent a lot of time there. So I can't help but wonder if that might be an answer to developing more media literacy for youth. And thank you. Hey everyone, it's me again, Yen. Um, and can I, before I start, get a show of hands of any of you that have been or are in Second Life? Look around, please, because this is probably going to be about you. But before I talk about that, um, I am going to talk about the typical gamer stereotype. So think about what that is, how it's been portrayed in the media, okay? Does it look something like this? Teens hanging out, messing around, geeking out, right? So um, the gamer stereotype has also been perpetuated in media too, right? So if we look at this article, for example, from the Washington Post on game addiction, they almost always highlight kids, more specifically young, white, male kids. Yet in a recent survey by the Entertainment Software Association in 2018, it shows that in the United States, the average gamer is 34 years old. Less than 30% of gamers are under 18. And get this, 45% are women. We're almost halfway there, right? <laughs> OK, so if 30% of gamers are under 18, where are the older gamers? What are they doing? So I stumbled upon this answer in my dissertation work in Second Life. Um, Second Life is a 3D virtual world where people use avatars to move around, communicate, and create their environment. It's like a cross between a digital makerspace and a social networking site. So my study was at the Builders Brewery, which is a volunteer-based school with builders, which refers to people who create um, content and build in Second Life. So here's a class of builders who are constructing lily ponds, a very important skill if you're making a fantasy garden. And um, what comes next is from my survey at the Builders Brewery, which had over 38,600 members as of last year from 21 different countries, varying um, pieces of education, 88% with some college, and 67% were over the age of 45. Okay, 67%. Um, the biggest age uh, differential was between 55 and 64. My smallest demographic were I am mentoring others. And he told me that Second Life keeps him mentally active. Every Sunday, he hosts a show and tell show. And at this event, people give presentations on the stuff that they've created, and the audience members vote for their favorites. Um, this is a great example of folks who are hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. These are our people in Second Life. You, me, grandparents, parents. My God, what are older people up to these days, right? <laughs> so one of my study informants said, it's fun to interact with people that have different experiences. You find a granny that makes mesh bodies, a bakery girl that makes clothing. You find university students, role players, and you meet creators. So what does this mean? OK, um, what does learning mean in a community with members from over 21 different countries who come from all walks of life? Did you guys just notice what we've been doing for the past three days? Right? So digital communities of learning are heterogeneous in terms of knowledge, age, nationality, and gender. And the avatars that they bring with them, I'm sorry, the avatars who bring their humans with them have a wealth of lived knowledge and experience. 
As William shares, I think a lot of people have taken their real life experience and knowledge and brought it into second life. It's kind of a no-brainer, right? Isn't that what we did in the past three days? So, um, William uh, was a computer programmer and uh, Jaden was an environmental scientist. Um, so what are the implications for learning in a virtual community that is generationally diverse? I could tell you a lot more, but I kind of ran out of time. So um, you can email me, talk to me afterwards, uh, or read my thesis. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>Hello. Uh, before I get started, can everyone have a loud round of applause really quick? I'm going to tell all my friends that was at the end. Um, well, I'm Rich Thompson. I am the U Media Springfield coordinator. And I'm going to be talking today about how we engage some of our students in our after school programs. Um, so we operate under Hamago, which, as we've heard, is hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. Um, we offer our students daily workshops that range from uh, audio production to video production and cooking and whatever he's making out of wood. Because we have a wood shop and a welding lab and a bike co-op and all kinds of things just to engage our students. Everything's free. They just drop in and they... The whole goal is a level up with what they find they're passionate about. So 20,000, that's how many students we have, student visits we've had in the last two years. That's from 1,300 high school age students, and that's pretty great numbers. But the question is, where are we still not being effective? And that was a question that we asked ourselves, looking at all of our data, and there's data upon data on data, and we looked at it and we got to this number, 50%. The 50% shows the amount of students that will participate in these workshops. So what about the other 50%? Well, a lot of them were coming and they were using the space for one of his purposes, hanging out. And that's great, because I will take them up in a game of Smash Brothers any day. But we were also kind of failing them because there wasn't any of the leveling up, which is part of our goal. So we took a step back. We actually talked to the kids. What do you want to do here? And, you know, that's when we kind of looked back at some of our programs and maybe making laser engraved Cleveland Browns coasters wasn't something that interested them. <laughs> it interested me. So one kid spoke up and said, well, I want to learn how to do special effects makeup. And then everybody want to do special effects makeup. <laughs> and so myself, knowing nothing about it, jumped head on and let's go for it. So what we did was we found a professional makeup, uh, professional makeup person who in his spare time was also a LARPer, who was the absolute best person we could ever find. So what he did, he taught them how to do wounds and zombies and all kinds of crazy stuff. And the results were awesome. We actually had to have kids sign up because everything was booked. And you had to book in like two weeks in advance just to do it. So we had all these new kids joining in our workshops, which is, again, the whole process that we were looking for. Seems longer than 15 seconds. <laughs> and then everything culminated with our fall showcase. The kids all said, well, we want to take what we've learned here. We want to show people what we're doing. So they put it together, they found food trucks to come, they built a 12 foot tall catapult for pumpkin chunking, and then we showed everyone what we did. But the question is like, how could we go beyond this? Because we can't just make zombies for a full school year. So Brian, our LARPer, he goes, well, I could teach him how to make stuff out of uh, styrofoam. I could teach him how to make all kinds of props. And then we started going into the realm of sewing. And then, so right here, that's Corinne, and she actually just won first place in the Ohio State Festival for, or Fair for her costume design. So now we're looking at all of these links be between all of our workshops coming together. We have kids going down to the welding lab that have never been down there.
because they want to go and learn how to make a sword for their costume. And then, America Jones. This is Ty. He's one of our art students that comes to U Media. And he got really, really into the whole cosplay aspect. And we kept wondering, like, you know, how is he making this transition to we want to do cosplay instead of art? Then we started looking at some of his art. And he was actually designing the things in real life that he was drawing. Because what he was doing is making a whole immersive thing because that he wanted to make it, his ideas, into a storyboard, into eventually making videos. So he was really the prototype of connecting everything and the whole idea of leveling up. So our outcomes. By listening to our students, kind of embracing different ways of learning and getting kids engaged, our workshop participation went up 25%. And our biggest takeaway is we need to stop listening to what we think is going to be cool and make sure that we're listening to what the students think is cool. Thank you. You made it to the end. Yeah. Rock on! <laughs> I am so amazed that there's this many people still in the room. Thank you so much for staying. So, um, so I'm Liz Lolly, and uh, I took this picture from the parking lot of the RIT campus in Dubrovnik, uh, Croatia. It's really not a bad place to spend a semester. And I'm going to tell you about, uh, I'm going to compress a 30-minute talk about the study abroad program I ran there into five minutes. So if you're not entirely sure where Dubrovnik is, it is there. Um, it was once the Republic of Ragusa, it is the Pearl of the Adriatic, and it is now one of the most popular cruise ship destinations on the Adriatic Sea. Um, the first year that I went there, my son, who was 16 at the time, took this picture from the city walls while we were walking the, the city, posted it with this caption to um, Facebook, and I had an idea at that point. Now, this is what the main street of the Stradoon looks like, the main drag through the old city when we arrive at the beginning of a semester. January is the off season, okay? And it's beautiful and ancient and sleepy, and then it's not, right? This is what happens when 10,000 cruise ship tourists get off a boat, you know, or multiple boats, and cram themselves into the old town. This is a problem. Right? And it's a problem the city is struggling with, but it turns out other people have struggled with this problem before. Okay? What happens when you have too many people in a space, right? How do we solve this? It's pathing problems, right? Um, game designers know how to deal with this. Um, and I could have just said, let's do a class on games and tourism in Rochester and had my students think about the problem, but I wanted them to go abroad. I wanted them to have this experience. Boy, on my stuff, it looked better. It was easier to read. Uh, I wanted them to have that immersive experience where they were in another culture, where they were really understanding the nature of the problem that they were trying to solve, not just reading about it. So I started marketing the problem. And you would be amazed at how hard it is to convince students to leave home, and you know, if home is campus, right? Recruiting students to do this was really difficult, and there's a whole separate talk on why. But I got this amazing group. These guys were spectacular, and I had them for three classes in the spring semester in Dubrovnik, and I got to, to really do some remarkable just-in-time learning with them about game design and about tourism. Right? Um, and so we did a lot of talking about tourism and the fact that tourism, like games, is about experience. Right? It's all about the experience of visiting some place. It's not just the place itself. Right? I had them do a bunch of different kinds of tours of Dubrovnik, not just the guided tours and not just the app-based tours. We used Sifter. Some of you who've worked with Eris may be familiar with Sifter to build an emotional heat map of the city based on where they had sort of resonance as they went through. And then they planned a game to solve this underlying problem, which is it's a problem for the tourists 
and it's a problem for the city when you have too many people all crammed into the same location. So they came up with a really, and this is, I have them do one page design documents. This was the design document they put together before they got started, and it was ambitious, right? Um, mobile augmented reality game, vampire theme, what lies beneath, all these different quests. The quests would in fact tie in to, I can't even tell you about that, you'll have to ask me later. I wanted them to focus on how you make a game, because 14 weeks and a bunch of sophomores does not add up to a commercial game, right? Um, so we used all these tools, and they mastered most of them. We did parallel development in Unity and Eris for most of the class. We ended up with the Unity and Viforia version of it. Um, and I'm happy to talk to people about why we went one way versus the other and what the advantages and disadvantages of the platform were. Every week I met with every student on the team for an hour. This is a luxury that in 21 years of teaching, I have never had that ability to meet one-on-one -on -one with students. It was wonderful. And that was where we met, is over that cup of coffee in, in a cafe. This is the game they built. These students pulled it off. They built a fully functional Android-based game with uh, augmented reality puzzles with quizzes, with mapping, all of it. Okay? Is it commercial yet? No, but it worked. Right? Uh, they also blogged. Every week I had them write a journal about how this experience was changing the way they thought about game design. Uh, about half of them chose to put them publicly, and you can find them at that URL. The rest of them submitted them to me as journals, because I won't require students to put that stuff up publicly. Um, it was a great experience. There was so much we learned, and I don't have time to tell you about any more of it, but thank you for being here. <laughs> Would you please join me in thanking and uh, congratulating all of these wonderful presenters? And can you give yourselves some love for being this present to the very end? Thank you. Can someone also please help me find Justin Reich who needs to sign his media release form? No, I'm just kidding. I see you. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Scott Osterwall to the stage, one of our hosts, um, who has some final goodies for people. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. I'm going to do four things. Uh, one is a quick, quick announcement. We learned um, after announcing the, the time of the, of the conference, the next conference in October 2019, that it butts up right against Rosh Hashanah, which would make travel hard for people. So we are going to tinker with the date so that that isn't a problem going forward. Secondly, we're not gonna, we were going to show the thank you slides, but we really did it in the first part. But I want you for a moment to hold a vision in your head of Claudia or Amanda or Jameson um, or Laura or Emily and Colton and give a huge round of applause for them again. Yeah. That was two. Three, we're going to give out those gifts. So I'm going to start by reading it. Uh, let me just tell you what the books are. So you can, if, you, if you're a winner, you can plan in advance. Um, there's our ga book, Resident Games. There's How to Be Black by Baratundi. There is Whiplash by Joe Ito. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, there's one by Barry Joseph. Um, I'm forgetting the name of his book. Okay. Seltzotopia. And then is there something else? A oh, Lifelong Kindergarten from Mitchell Resnick. And, uh, oh, this is a, a CD from, um, from the late Bernie DeCoven. Uh, those of us who knew Bernie still are feeling the loss of him, and, and uh, someone will be able to walk away with this CD. Um, so they're all there, but uh, I'm going to read the names in order. If you're here, come up. You get to pick whichever one you want. Um, so the first name is Yu Jung Hong. Second is David Barrell, or Burrell. Forgive me for not knowing. Third, after David, is Shelley Mehta. she here? She's not here. OK, that means that the, the next one is Timu uh, Linonen. And forgive me, I'm sure I got that wrong. 
Is that Finnish? Yeah, thank you. Um, then is Anita Baron or Baron? Baron. Jesse Nixon. After Jesse is Kevin Miklosh. Is Kevin still here? He is. Okay. We still have, after Kevin, we still have four more to go. So after Kevin is Ian Schreiber. And after Ian is Michelle King. <laughs> Last two, Michelle to you. Michelle to you. All right, then we got two more. Owen Gottlieb. And finally, Ricardo Elizalde. Is Ricardo here? No. Stacy Carmen? No, I'm taking it now. Oh, Apostolos. Kutropolis. All right. And I'm glad I had an opportunity to pronounce your name. So, um, while Apostolos is doing that, I just, the last thing is I just wanted to make a small comment. Obviously, thanking you all for coming on behalf of all of us who organized it. Yesterday at lunch, I, the one thing you should, everyone should do in your life, if you can, is have lunch with Drew Davidson at some point. And I did that yesterday, and Drew and I were talking, and he said that he thinks that everyone in our field are mutts, and that we all are, we come from lots of different fields. We're not, we didn't grow up in the work we're doing. We grew up in some other field and have all found our way here, and so we're all mutts. And he thinks that's why, as a group, we are, uh, tend to be co tolerant and generous and supportive of each other, something I totally agree with. I mean, I guess I just want to reframe it the way I think of it, um, it's the privilege of sometimes being the oldest guy in the room, which I think I am. I can say um, that after looking at a long career, uh, you know, working hard is important, creativity is important, um, passion is important, but uh, the thing that really matters most is kindness. And um, that's something this community has shown, we've all shown each other over the last three days, and I hope we'll continue to show that in the coming years. Um, I look forward to seeing you all again uh, in Irvine in a little over a year. And thank you very much. Thank you.